Welcome to Fairview Baptist Church in Lindsay. Not only do we want to minister to the people who regularly attend Fairview, but we also want to minister to those who live within the city of Kortha Lakes with the good news of Jesus Christ. Come on in and, and join us for worship. It is our prayer that you'll be blessed. I guess I have to turn it off every time I use it and then turn it back up. Okay. Sorry about that. Thanks, worship team, for leading us this morning. A number of years ago, a good friend and I decided to do a major hike up Mount Robson on the border of BC and Alberta. It was going to be a four day trek to do this, and we were young, we were in really good shape. And we were excited about it. And, and we were prepared. We had 60 pounds on our backs and a tent, food, lots of food because we're young, change of clothes and, and, and clothing and water. And the weather was perfect, almost even better than perfect. It was about 28 to 30 degrees in the mountains. It was hot. It was beautiful. And looking back, what we experienced on this trip was absolutely amazing. Our goal was to make it to Berg Lake Campground. It was way high up in the mountain, and uh, it was a popular place to be. A lake was there, and there were icebergs floating in the lake. And right off to the side, you see the glacier there, and, and all these icebergs would break off the glacier. It was a beautiful place. Since it was called Berg Lake that way. So we took off, and we walked across swinging bridges. We walked across uh, by, this, by this river, and we followed the river up all along the way. We went into old-growth forest, 100-year-old trees, big trees. It's like a rainforest. We kept hiking, and we came to the first campsite, and when we got to the first campsite, it was just a beautiful cathedral, a wilderness cathedral, and we enjoyed it out there. And we continued along the way, and uh, we, we had to hike up a, a, this, these switchbacks. It was difficult. It was hot. It was difficult. Our backpacks were so heavy. And as we were hiking up, we, we noticed way off in the distance this stream coming off of the, the, uh, the mountain. We said, that's quite interesting. And that's all we thought. It was so far away. And we kept hiking up this mountain and we came across some waterfalls and, and we kept hiking. We looked down this one cliff and way off on the far distance, we saw a black bear climbing up the mountain. We kept hiking and we saw a beautiful deer right beside us, almost could eat out of our hands. It was amazing. Unbelievable. And, and as we kept walking, we heard this, this loud roar. And we turned the corner and we came across this beautiful waterfall. It was a river flowing off the mountain, glacier water. And it was hot. And we were tired. And we went underneath that and we froze. But it was good. And, and then we continued hiking up that mountain. And it got tough. We were exhausted. My friend's leg cramped up and I had to push him up the mountain. And we finally made it. And we finally made it to Berg Lake Campground. And we just enjoyed the view there and enjoyed our time there. And we said, we did it. We did it. And part of the fun was the journey. Um, it, 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 was, it was so much, it was such the experience. It was tough. It was a challenge. But we saw some beauty along the way. I remember while we were up there at this campsite, I I remember meeting a camper who was about five foot eight, probably about 250 pounds and out of shape. I wondered how in the world did he ever get there? The climb was so grueling for us. So I asked him, so what'd you think of the climb? He said, I didn't climb, I got a helicopter ride up here. <laughs> I thought to myself, you know, the view up here is so beautiful. The view up here is so beautiful but you missed so much on the journey. You missed so much on the journey. And sometimes as we experience this different journeys in life, don't, don't you find that? Uh, the final destination, you get there, but part of the fun was the journey. The bus ride to the retreat with all the youth on it, it was so much fun. It made the retreat so much better. Or, or the scenic route that you took out east on that camping trip was so great. Or, or that train ride, it, to that destination, and, and just seeing the things along that train ride made it all worthwhile. I invite you to take your Bibles, turn to Exodus chapter 6, 
verses 6 through 12. It's a familiar story of Moses leading the children of Israel, the people of God out of Egypt. Starting a new series called The Cost of Community. And for the next number of weeks, I want us to go on this journey together. And we'll be examining the people of God throughout Scripture, the community of believers within Scripture, and how we need to be a strong community of believers. Next week, there will be notes within your bulletin. And, um, and with these notes, there will be questions and passages to look up that you can take into your small group and discuss it within your small group and work through. It's just to get a little bit deeper and personal with what it means to be part of of the community of believers. So we're asking all our small groups if they would take a break from their regular study and work through the study that we'll be doing as a church. If you're not in a small group, uh, you could personally work through those questions yourself too. So let's look at Exodus 6, 6 through 12. It says this. This is God talking to Moses. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. I, am, I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, and I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hands to give to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. And Moses reported to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because their discouragement and cruel bondage. Then the Lord said to Moses, go, tell Pharaoh the king of Egypt to let the Israelites go out of this country. But Moses said to the Lord, if the Israelites won't listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Since I speak with faltering Familiar story of the children of Israel being led out of Egypt. God gave a hint to Moses when he was at the burning bush that he had a plan. You can read about that in chapter 3 of Exodus. And Moses told the elders in chapter 4 that God was concerned for their plight and God had a plan. But really, this is the first time that the Israelites heard the message. This is the first time they heard what the plan was. And what did the Israelites say? Yahoo! Let's go! Let's pack our bags! Let's go on this trip! Let's get going! No. They didn't listen. Because they had such abuse from their captor. They didn't listen because they were abused by their owner, the Egyptians. And time and time again, if you study people in abusive relationships, they tend to stick with that relationship. In fact, they can't see anything else. Uh, They desperately need freedom. They desperately need healthiness. But they're trapped in this bondage, and they can't see any way out. Remember the story of J.C. Dugard? She was kidnapped as an 11-year-old. And for 18 years, she had to live with her abductor. And for the past number of her later 18 years, she was able to move around quite freely. And you've got to ask yourself, well, why didn't she run away? Why, why didn't she leave this captor? Because she, 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 was, she could have done that. She could have run to the next door neighbor. She could have done that. Why didn't she run away? Well, as they found out she was brainwashed. She lived in fear. And she couldn't see life any other way than being with her captive, with her captor. And you know what? So many people would rather take abuse. So many people would rather live in squalor because that's what they're used to. It's familiar. They don't know what freedom looks like, and they're comfortable with the abuse they're living in. But, you know, God wants to give us more. God wanted to give his people more. He wanted to give them more. But too often, people change from one abuser to the next. 
someone grows up with a tough childhood, they grow up a little bit and they turn to abuse of drugs and they abuse drugs. And then they think a relationship will solve the issues and they, just, they turn to an abusive spouse. And instead of finding, hold, finding wholeness and freedom and the one who created us, they move from one mess to the next to the next and they create more messes. Sometimes we're just have an abusive state of mind. We, we find ourselves saying to ourselves, we're defeated, we're defeated, we're defeated. And we dwell on the problems and we'd rather stay in that defeat. God is calling the Israelites out of their place. And God calls us out of abusive relationships too. Notice that there were three things that God promised Moses God promised the Israelites. The first thing was that he was going to take them out of slavery in verse 6. The second thing was he was going to take them as his own people and care for them in verse 7. And then in verse 8, he tells us that he's going to give them the land, the land that he promised them. And, And so as Moses heard this, most likely what was going through his head was, how would this happen? How is this going to happen, God? What's going to happen here? How long will this be? How long will this be? How long will this happen? And and that's probably the first question. This is wishful thinking. It's it's not an easy thing for this to happen, for the, the slaves to be freed. The most powerful nation on the earth, Egypt at the time, with the most sophisticated weapons, would not let their slaves go. How in the world would this occur? What would it take? In 1833, the British Empire finally said they would abolish slavery. They had it for hundreds of years. It would cost the whole British Empire's half of their annual budget to let that happen. One historian called it voluntary econocide. It changed the world dramatically and made many people poor because they lost all these slaves. It was a huge task to have happen. Lots of lobbying of the government, lots of politics that needed to happen, speeches, education, a great sacrifice to let the slaves be free from the British Empire. And for the Israelites to leave Egypt, it would almost be next to impossible for a simple solution. No one's fighting on their behalf. How long would it take? How long would it take? Starting around 1787, William Wilberforce set out on a journey to end slavery in the British Empire and end it in the world. That was 1787. It wasn't until 1833, three days before his death, that he heard the Slavery Abolition Act for all the British Empire read in Parliament. His whole adult life, he fought to see this happen. It took 46 years. What was going through Moses' mind? How would this happen? How is this going to take place? Well, God was at work. He did a few miracles. In fact, he did 10 miracles. The 10 plagues that went on to Egypt. He did it in a very short time, uh, probably within a couple months. And and it would have been amazing for the Israelites to journey through that. Wow, God, take a look what you're doing to the people who have put us in captivity, these Egyptians. You brought these plagues on them, and and we're not even being affected by these plagues. Wow. Wow, God, you're so great. Wow. And and, and so Pharaoh said, get out of here. You guys are freed. Get out of here. And so... That happened. Slavery, they were brought out of slavery quite quickly. And, and then the next thing God said, he says, I'm going to take them to be my own people and care for them. Well, how long would that happen? Uh, Pharaoh didn't really want them to go for a long time. In fact, he changed his mind. He sent his army out after them. And, and as the children of Israel were going into the wilderness, God led them to the Red Sea. And they thought, oh, no, this is it. We're dead. We're going to be captive Uh, put in captivity again, and God did another miracle. He parted the sea, he destroyed the Egyptian army, and they left them alone. They left them alone. 
And God in the wilderness on the other side of the Red Sea, he set up around Mount Sinai uh, the worship system. He set up the tabernacle and clearly showed the Israelites how he would be their God and how he wanted them to be his people. It happened so quickly. In fact, after the plagues, it happened within a matter of, of days, if not a month. It wasn't that long. Two of these promises being fulfilled in a relatively short time. Then you have the third promise. I'm going to give you some land. I'm going to give you some land, Israelites. I'm going to give you the promised land. And and so God said, tell you what, go take it. Go and take it. I'll I'll give you it just like I gave, uh, took you out of Egypt. I'll I'll give you it like I've, I've took you to be my people. But instead of listening to God, instead of following God, they followed their fears. And you can read about that in Numbers chapter 13 and 14. Two of the 12 spies, Joshua and and Caleb, said, God, with your leading, we'll take this. But the other 10 said, no, we're too frightened. No, there are giants in the land. No, we can't do it. We can't do it. There's no way we can do it. Yeah, and there is no way they could do it. But Joshua and Caleb knew God had a plan. And so because they gave into their fears, because they didn't trust the Lord for 40 years, the children of Israel wandered around in the wilderness. And that one generation had to die for the next one to see the promised land. What a journey that was. Much longer than they thought. That whole generation had to die out. But God took them on an interesting journey. They were given the law. They were given manna. Their their clothing never wore out. Many lessons to learn along the way. But it was a long journey time. And they had to go through that journey to appreciate the promised land. When they finally reached the promised land, as we know how scripture unfolds, that wasn't the end either. They were to live as his people, and they were to be the shining light to the world around them as the people of God, but they had difficulty doing that. Really, the promised land is a picture for the eternal place where God will eventually dwell the new Jerusalem, the perfect people of God. And today we await the true king to return once again and establish his eternal kingdom to make things right. And today we are called the people of God. We are the local body of believers called together to be his bride. And there are many other local bodies of believers around the world. And God wants to do something through each of us. God wants to do something within these local body believers to lead us to a journey and lead us to this new place. And we will eventually end up in that promised land. But he wants his body to journey. He wants his body to be a community. So what does he want us to do? What does he want us to do? And and Pastor Steve and Pastor Vic and I, we got away this past week. And, and we, we said, God, what do you want us to do this next year? What do you want us to do in the future as we seek direction for your church? Well, some of the things we want to do this year, the Bible makes very clear. We're called to worship him with our lives. We're called to be holy. We're supposed to proclaim his good message to the world, grow and be disciples. We need to see people be baptized. We need to celebrate communion and, and practice communion because we're told to do that. We are to equip the saints with their gifts, and we are to live out our lives with our gifts, using our spiritual gifts. And so as we went away on this retreat, we realized these things had to do happen, but God, what else do you want us to do this year? So we prayed, and we thought, and, and we wrestled on, on some things, and, and, and we, we put some goals together that we should put forward as we journey as a church. We came up with this list, and this list is not carved in stone. It's not exactly everything spilled out, but we need to aim for something. And so I want to share this with you, and so you can pray about it, think about it, and, and we'll discuss it in the future. The board, in fact, still needs to discuss some of these things. So nothing is for certain, but let, let's just put them through. The first thing is a value statement. A value statement brings clarity to things that matter here at Fairview, and they're what we want to continue to see here at this church and what we want to focus on as a ministry. 
And uh, we'll be listing these values in the next little while. We'll be working through them as a leadership team, but we also need your input on them. And we'll be, uh, we'll be presenting them in the near future. Another thing is the Constitution. The Constitution. Our, our present Constitution has been in place for the past 13 years. And we are an incorporated church, and we need to renew our incorporation and resubmit our Constitution, I believe, by the end of 2014. Now, some things have changed within our church in the past 13 years, and we need to look over this Constitution, change some of the language, think through how we have done things in the past, and how possibly we're going to continue to do them in the next 10 to 15 years, and rethink through that Constitution. So a team will be put together to review, think through our Constitution this year. And again, you'll be given an opportunity to give input throughout the process. Last November, I, led a, I went with a team down to Haiti to explore different ministries down there, and we hope to get a plan together to take a team down there this summer. Internship and staffing, as many of you know, we have at least one young man who seems to have the call of God on his life for ministry. He's finishing up his final semester at university and hoping to start seminary in the fall. He can do an internship with our denomination here. And I think we need to seriously consider how we can invest in Tyler and prepare him for that ministry that God has in store for him. Also, our new custodian, Andrew Archibald, is wrestling with what type of ministry God is calling him into. And I believe we need, as a, as a church, need to build into the lives of these young men and also possibly other young people too. More details and discussion will follow. Future land. Uh, we've done renovations to this building, but we're growing. And we need to think through the future and where we might relocate five, ten years from now. But we need to first start with a piece of land and find a piece of land. So a team will need to be put together. A plan for purchasing this land needs to be put together. More discussion. We've talked in the past about church planting about reaching more people. There are thousands and thousands of people within this town alone that don't, do not belong to an evangelical church. There, there, are, there are thousands of people in between Lindsay down to Orono where there's no evangelical church. What does God want us to do? Maybe about church planting. Maybe establish a multi-site, which is similar to a church plant, but it, it doesn't involve as great of an investment. Well, a team and a plan needs to be put together on how to work this thing through. I want to challenge us once again for prayer and fasting. A special time of prayer and fasting, and we can do that before Easter. And then there's the final. I don't have this plan. I don't know what it's going to look like. But what unknown things will come our way this year that God will say, hey, church, Fairview, you got to move on this. You got to do this. Who knows? Who knows? When God told Moses, I have a plan, Moses didn't know what timeline these things would happen. He had no idea what type of journey God had in store for him and the people of God. But I believe God has placed these things on my heart as your pastor. And let's see what God has in store this year as we journey ahead for his glory. You know, the cost for Moses was great. And the cost for the community of God was great. And let me tell you, it's going to cost something as we move ahead. It's going to cost time. It's going to cost energy. And with some of these things, it's going to cost money. It's going to be a sacrifice for us as a church corporately, but it'll be a sacrifice for you personally. Are we willing to go on this journey? Are we willing to seek what God has in store for it? So I'm going to encourage you to pray about it and, and think about it and, and in the future give input to it. So this year, can I encourage you to seek God and ask, what do you want to do in Fairview this year? And let's go on a journey together. I'm going to ask Gary if he'd come up and and uh, we're going to close off with a song, Lead On, O King Eternal. Because it's not Pastor John you're following after. It's not a board of 
deacons that you're following after. It's really the King Eternal that we're following after. And we need to seek his direction. Let's, Lord Jesus, let's thank you for the way that you lead us on. And we want to be following after you. We want to be seeking your direction for us personally, for us corporately as a church. Thank you that you do give us that vision. You do give us that direction. And we want to just continue walking in that. Father, what do you have in store for us this year? What, what, what do you want to do with Fairview Baptist Church? I pray, Lord, that you'd continue to give us wisdom. Lord, you'd give us unity as we move ahead. Lord, you'd help us to consider the cost and, and, and stand up and, and take some steps of faith for your glory here. Thank you for this time together. And, and Lord, as we depart from here, I pray that you would uh, bless those who have come through the doors here and uh, leave us with your blessing. It is our desire to encourage you through this program. If you do not yet belong to a church, we'd love to have you come and connect with us. We have programs for all ages. There is a spiritual need, or if you have been blessed through our service, we'd love to hear from you. You can contact us during regular office hours by phone, or you can email us. Thank you for watching our service. May God bless you.